We're joined by Ben Barry. He's a lawyer with Martin Hardy and Mazzotti, and he's here to give us some insights on a couple of issues. Let's start off talking about the spigot opening. Governor Phil Scott is talking about allowing the spigot to open up a little bit. Businesses opening up to customers, employees returning to work. There's a lot of liability in that that I think people would be concerned about. Yeah, you're correct. And I think that the um, Vermont government is concerned with that as well. Um, With respect to lawsuits emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, I I think the the jury is still kind of out yet to determine whether or not employers would be responsible for um, work site injury related to the virus and and other liability things when when we're talking about the government issuing some mandate or allowing government to, to start picking back up where they left off really unclear as to what kind of liability would be ascribed and whether or not there would be any causes of action for, for example, for an employee working a cash register, working with an employee who has COVID-19 and wasn't quarantined or taking um, precautions. And that employee, for example, requested and did not receive personal protection. I think one of the more interesting things that I think is going to be a hotbed for legal issues is some of this talk about contact uh, tracing, which um, Governor Scott has mentioned, and many other states are um, engaged in very elaborate plans to roll out programs that will contact people who have been in contact with someone who's showing signs of the virus. I think a lot of individuals, from a legal perspective, are concerned about the government's attempt at uh, implementing government oversight and, and tracking of people in some way, whether that be a telephone call or some kind of electronic data mining using cell phones and things like that. So I, my own personal interest is really kind of focused on the contact tracing and how that all plays out because that is one of the four prongs that Governor Scott laid out as being very important as we turn this spigot and allow commerce to continue the way that it was. One of the things that they are going to implement is a, what seems to be a rather robust program for, for tracking individuals. And there has been a lot of pushback in general um, to other programs like the Patriot Act, for example, where the government is taking on this role of, of really tracking and monitoring people. So ben, it's the very con- interesting to see what happens in that respect. So, Ben, the concern then is, uh, pri- is over privacy issues? It is. I think generally most people are adverse to um, any government intrusion, really. Um, and so the idea... I think for some people is that if a government carries a stick, they're going to use it to beat up the citizens. Now, the government is saying, look, we need this stick because the monitoring is going to be important to prevent the spread, and ultimately um, taking away some of your privacy is going to serve a greater good, and that is protecting you so that you can do the things that you want to do. So giving up this little bit of privacy is ultimately going to serve this much wider, greater good. I think people are concerned about that. They're leery of that. There are a lot of people who are not really willing to give up information. And and certainly they're not willing to um, not be allowed to actively consent to that. And I think that there are parallels here. There was, there was talk in Iowa and some other political events where information geo-tracking was, was Geotracking was allowed at these events by third parties, and people's data was being taken. Right. Um, and a lot of people were upset with that. A lot of people were offended because, one, they didn't consent to it. Two, it was an, an information mining event, and people don't know what happens to their information. And there's a marketplace for it. Yeah. There's yeah. a marketplace and for information. Ben, I'm in marketing. I, I have a, an agency of my own, and believe me, I, I get this. Um, privacy always comes up as a concern, but it also comes up as a concern and people don't realize how much of their information is out there because they signed up for a deal or they signed up and bought something online. It, that information is out there. We're talking about public health, though, superseding some of that right um, and being able to collect that information. And they can do that through third parties as well as those first-party interviews that the health department has talked about. It's absolutely correct. 
I think I, I think that some of this is really just a, a coming out of sorts about the information age in which we live. So from from one perspective, we the government is just actually um, taking on some of the work that has been done by these third parties who are doing it either with the consumer's knowledge or without their knowledge. Now we've got the government doing it. That, I think, seems a little bit different to people in some respects, and also government is very easy to point at. It's, it's much more difficult for citizens to point at some small LLC that was formed in Delaware who shows up with some kind of device that can pick up information from a cell phone, and, you know, when things get nasty, the LLC just kind of disappears, and, you know, who knows where the data has gone. It's run off into the it's run off into the information web. Yeah. Right. So I think it's I think the government saying we are going to collect data is is probably a very big easy I would say quote unquote enemy to point at and say you shouldn't be doing this and if you shouldn't be doing it for the for the better good neither should all of these other companies that are doing it for some other potentially nefarious reason. Well, there's no doubt that when it comes to privacy and government, that, that, that raises people's antennas and, and red flags. Hey, Ben, can you also talk just for a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court now, for the first time in this 230-year history, hearing arguments by telephone? What kind of challenges does that present? Yeah, that's a, that's a great topic. That's probably something I'm more familiar with, um, the ongoings of the Supreme Court, which is really kind of, um, obviously, it's the top court of our country, Oral arguments generally are a very insignificant portion of the entire process by which the Supreme Court hears a case. There are legal briefs that are submitted prior to attorneys going to the Supreme Court, which is an awe-inspiring um, event, I would think, in an attorney's uh, career. I've been to the Supreme Court. I haven't argued there, but I did go as a tourist, and it's just an unbelievable building. Currently, the Supreme Court is hearing the May docket by teleconference. It's never done that before. Uh, many of the Supreme Court justices are over the age of 65, and so they are in a very vulnerable population. There's actually only three, Kagan, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, who are under the age of 65. But the oral arguments are scheduled to proceed in the same way or the similar format that they are generally conducted, which is there's a court clerk brief at 9 a.m. for the 10 a.m. session. Our arguments are held in two-minute intervals, uh, petitioner and respondent, and then there's a one hour of time where the justices will be able to ask questions of the attorneys who are arguing their cases um, to resolve any, any sticky issues that the justices might have. The... Supreme Court usually is, uh, there, there's a little bit of back and forth between the justices and attorneys will be able to feed on visual cues. Is uh, Chief Justice Roberts grimacing? Is Justice Sotomayor smiling? What is going on? And there are a lot of visual cues that oral argument can be informed by. That is not going to be the case. And so it will be very interesting to see how this all plays out. There is also some information that's shared between the justices themselves and body language that attorneys can oftentimes capitalize on. That won't be present either. The justices will be asking questions in order of rank or seniority. Justice Roberts goes first, uh, Kavanaugh goes last, and the justices, based on the time, the length of their um, time on the court, will go in descending order. So Roberts, Thomas, Ginsburg, Breyer, Alito, Sotomayor, Kagan, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh will go in that order. be very interesting to see what happens. be very interesting to hear the audio of those arguments, which are all available online at the thesupremecourt.gov. It sounds like uh, you're not in favor of this, much like you probably wouldn't be in favor of doing the same thing in a poker game. <laughs> you just you got to be able to well, see that body language in order to uh, in order to kind of know where you're heading. But we we really do appreciate your insight, Ben Barry, lawyer with Martin Hardy and Masati. Remember, you can always reach out to him at one eight hundred Law Ten Ten dot com.